Today he is going to enlighten us on the topic, The Leper's Truth, an Inquiry in Critical Medical Legal Humanities. Presenting to you, Dr. Dilip Kumar Das. Thank you very much. Uh, I must first uh, thank uh, the Pratyaya Foundation and the Sacred Heart College for inviting me and giving me this great opportunity to witness the launch of an organization that I have uh, deep appreciation for. Uh, and thank you also for the many kind words describing uh, you know, my, my achievements, which I am not aware of my, myself. I have never thought of myself as an erudite person. Nobody has ever called me erudite, actually, so far. Uh, Pragyam Foundation is the first organization that has officially dubbed me erudite by inviting me to deliver the first endowment erudite lecture. Anyway, I, I don't, uh, uh, I, I hope I don't disappoint you uh, <coughs> with my, uh, I suspect, uh, fairly uh, uh, deep lack of erudition. So uh, my, in my uh, talk, which I'll actually, I'm going to read out for two reasons. One, one is this is a very formal occasion, it's part of a uh, 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 lecture series. And second, for coherence and for time, because this is a topic that uh, will be difficult to uh, talk about in detail uh, within a brief period. So uh, I'll be reading out this talk, but I'll, be, uh, uh, I'll try to read it out slowly so that it, uh, uh, it, it is uh, uh, <coughs> clear. It's titled, The Leper's Truth, An Inquiry in Critical uh, uh, Medical Legal Humanities. I'm actually presenting two different but related, connected arguments in this paper. First, is the discursive construction of persons with leprosy as a danger to society and a problem for the law. This is the thematic uh, uh, concern uh, <coughs> of my talk. And then my talk also has a methodological component. That is, humanities as a methodological resource for a critique of medical legal discourse. By method in the humanities, I mean the analysis of texts in terms of how they construct meanings and shape our understanding of the reality they seek to represent. Reading a court judgment not on the disciplinary procedures of legal studies, but through such a method in the humanities, I argue can offer insights into why the diseased body is a problem for a law informed by medicine, how such law poses it as a problem, and what kind of a resolution it offers. Further, by placing the judgment in the context of other related discourses about leprosy, this approach can, as Lawrence Grossberg in a very important essay on cultural studies, claimed with regard to interdisciplinary cultural studies. We've been talking about the need for inter interdisciplinary. Professor Sanu, I understand, spoke about him. Since I don't know Malayalam, I didn't actually get his talk, but I had the opportunity of talking to him uh, uh, during the break. And I understand that he spoke about the need for an interdisciplinary perspective that humanities can bring to other areas of knowledge. And so this, <coughs> my talk is precisely about that. Uh, Grossberg says, Interdisciplinarity can say something new about the context, which can open up new strategic understandings, unquote. That is, it is not a mere intellectual exercise, but a crucial strategy for understanding and countering the stigmatization of persons with disease, and can offer, as Grossberg continues, quote, a theoretically grounded basis for intervening into contexts and power, unquote. My primary text is a judgment of the Supreme Court of India, Dhirendra Pandwa versus State of Orissa, 2008, on the right of persons with leprosy to hold public office. Let me briefly recount this case. In 2003, Dhirendra Pandwa was elected councillor and subsequently chairperson of the Basudevpur NAC, Notified Area Council, in Orissa. One of his contestants, Suresh Mahanti, 
filed a petition with the election tribunal challenging Pandwa's appointment on the ground that he had leprosy. Section 16.14 of the Orissa Municipal Act 1950 disqualifies persons with leprosy, tuberculosis and insanity from contesting for the elections to council. <coughs> While Section 17.1b rules that persons elected and appointed as councillors shall cease to hold office if they are subsequently found to have any of these diseases. Examining the facts of the case, the election tribunal set aside Pandwa's election and ordered him to demit office. Pandwa then petitioned the High Court of Orissa, uh, <coughs> challenging the tribunal's order on the ground that he had been cured of leprosy on the date of the election. But the High Court, on re-examining the evidence, found this to be factually incorrect and dismissed Pandwa's petition. He eventually appealed to the Supreme Court which also confirmed the evidence presented in the election tribunal and the High Court and upheld their verdicts. Pandwa, therefore, was compelled to resign from the post of councillor chairperson of the NAC because of his disease. In the first part of my talk, I analyzed the judgment's construction of persons with leprosy as a source of danger, in that word I'm quoting from the judgment actually, as a source of danger to public health, which, as I will show, is undermined by internal contradictions of meaning. Court judgments are veridical texts. That is, texts that try to establish the truth. And I examine how the judgment decides on the truth of leprosy, that's why the leper's truth in the title, the truth of leprosy, in a manner that I show to be deeply problematic. The court's argument hinges on the assumption that leprosy is a contagious disease. I'm taking the word from the judgment. Leprosy is a contagious disease. So the second part of my talk will examine a number of texts in which this assumption was constructed, circulated, legitimized, and presented as the truth of leprosy. Under imperatives that ranged from the medical to the political, the cultural and evangelical. The texts include two books written in the 1880s by a priest, Henry Presswright, urging segregation of lepers in the English colonies to prevent re-entry of leprosy into England where it had been almost eradicated since the 17th century. Then a 1926 short story by Arthur Conan Doyle about the fear of leprosy imported from <coughs> colonial South Africa. Then reports by medical professionals on the presumed contagiousness of leprosy published in the 1880s and 1890s when the debate over contagion was at its peak. And finally, I look at a report published in 1901 on the work of missionaries in leprosy asylums in India by an official of a charitable organization that funded such asylums. My reading, and here I come to a very, very crucial methodological uh, assumption on which this work is founded. My reading of these texts is based on the view that we know diseases through the way we construct them as problems in social constructions that shape our responses to disease and to persons with disease. This does not deny that diseases are biological phenomena with a reality that cannot be reduced to their social constructions. The discursive construction of disease refers not to the reality of disease, but to the way in which we understand and respond to that reality. It refers, in other words, to what I call the social reality of the experience of disease, both our own and of others. As Charles E. Rosenberg writes in a very important early essay called uh, <coughs> Frames and Framers, the Construction of Diseases in History, as Charles E. Rosenberg, who is an anthropologist, writes, <coughs> disease is as at once, and a quote from Rosenberg, disease is at once a biological event, a generation-specific, 
the repertoire of verbal constructs reflecting medicine's intellectual and international history, an aspect of and potential, potential legitimation for public policy. We we'll see this, how this actually is reflected in the context of leprosy. A potentially defining element of social role, a sanction for cultural norms, we see that also in the context of leprosy, and a structuring element in doctor-patient interactions. In some ways, Rosenberg writes, disease does not exist until we have agreed that it does by perceiving, naming, and responding to it. <coughs> Let me now <coughs> turn to the Supreme Court decision in Dhirendra Pandwa's case. <coughs> the court's argument, as I have said, hinges on the question of the contagiousness of leprosy. The provisions of section 16.1.4 and 17.1 b of the Orissa Municipal Act, which disqualify persons with leprosy from holding public office, seem to contradict Article 14 of the Constitution, the right to equality before law and equal protection of the law. By disqualifying a class of persons, which it defines as lepers, leprosy patients, these sections seem to be discriminatory and deny equality to that class, constituting what in law is called class legislation. The court's argument, however, is that Article 14 prohibits class legislation, but not reasonable classification for the purpose of lawmaking. The test for such reasonable classification, it says, is A that the class differentia must be intelligible and objective, and b, that the classification must bear a rational relation to the object sought. <coughs> On the first condition, that is uh, intelligibility of criteria, on the first condition, leprosy can be objectively diagnosed and intelligible difference established between those who have it and those who do not. On the second condition, Leprosy is a transmissible disease. It can be transmitted from person to person. And segregating those who are infected seems to bear a rational relation to the objective of preventing its spread. That is the court's position on Pandora's leprosy. The classification under which persons with leprosy are disqualified is reasonable, according to the court. Section 16.1.4 and 17.1.B of the Orissa Municipal Act do not contradict Article 14 and Pandua therefore must demit office. That is the stand of the court. When we reflect on this, however, we realize that the position is tenable only if leprosy is a highly transmissible and incurable disease, in which case the objective of preventing its spread becomes so urgent that a citizen's fundamental rights under Article 14 can be set aside. It is the court's responsibility to protect fundamental rights, not place them under suspension for particular individuals. So the reason must be urgent enough for the court to be satisfied that here is a case which justifies the suspension of Dhirendra Pandwa's right under Article 14 of the Constitution. So let us examine how the court establishes this as the truth of leprosy. It begins by citing a medical text, the Sloan Dogland Medical Legal Dictionary, which defines leprosy as follows. And I'm quoting from the court's quotation from the judgment, I mean from the dictionary. Quote, Leprosy, which is also known as Hansen's disease, is a mildly infectious, this is how the Sloan Dorkel Dolan defines it, is a mildly infectious degenerative disease caused by the microorganism Mycobacterium leprae. The judgment then goes on to describe leprosy as, and I quote from the judgment, a major health problem for man since time immemorial, curable nowadays, but which leaves behind a terrifying image of disfigurement, the patient and his family are ostracized from the society." Unquote. Thus, it supplements the scientific definition, which is a kind of bare-bones account of leprosy. It supplements the scientific definition of the disease, 
with a gloss that emphasizes the fear and stigma associated with it, such that leprosy, even if it is curable nowadays, is nevertheless terrifying. In the operative part of the judgment, where it rules that 16.14, section 16.14 and 17.1b do not contradict Article 14, the judgment states as follows, and I'm quoting from the judgment. Being a contagious disease, being a contagious disease, it can be transmitted via droplets from the nose or mouth during close and frequent contacts with untreated infected persons. Therefore, the other elected councillors or the members of the public with whom they are required to have day-to-day -day close contact as municipal councillors may also get affected by the disease." Unquote. In other words, the judgment has, in the course of its argument, effected a terminological shift from the mildly infectious of the slow and dolent definition to the contagious in the above account. While both infection and contagion refer to disease processes, there is a difference between the two terms. Infection refers to such process within the individual body, while contagion refers to the process of disease transmission from body to body. So we can see how the idea of contagion would serve better for the court to establish its claim that the disqualification of persons with leprosy is rational. Ideas of contagion, as Mary Douglas, the British anthropologist, has argued in Purity and Danger, are closely linked to the moral notion of pollution and can serve as instruments for excluding those who are held to threaten the social order, either the medical social order or the moral social order. In fact, in Risk and Blame, another book that she wrote much later, <coughs> based on the same insights, in, in an essay in Risk and Blame, actually, on leprosy and witchcraft, in fact, in Risk, Risk and Blame, Douglas argues that accusations of leprosy have historically served to condemn socially disapproved individuals and confine them to leprosaria. Disease, she maintains, and I quote from Douglas, can be a resource for maintaining particular cultural regimes, unquote. Thus, in medieval Europe, she writes, the leper's diseased body was the reprehensible metaphor of social disorder. And I quote a passage from <coughs> her book. <coughs> lepers were now, that is, she's talking about 13th century, 13th century Europe. Lepers were now held to be highly infectious. The disease was thought to be transmitted by sexual penetration. Endowed with an inordinate sexual appetite, lepers were incestuous, lepers were rapists, lepers sought to spread their condition by forced sexual intercourse with healthy persons, segregated for the public good, they were not allowed to move freely in London streets, they were not able to prosecute at law, nor to inherit land, nor to transmit land rights that they might otherwise have had by inheritance. They were effectively stripped from citizenship. Unquote. Of course, this is far too severe than the Supreme Court's exclusion of Pandua from the enforcement of his right under Article 14. And there is much distance between the bigotry of medieval European kingdoms and the laws of a modern democratic state. But consonances there are, and they are not insignificant. In Pandua's case, the court upholds the wisdom of a legislature calls it wisdom, actually, the wisdom of a legislature, and I'm quoting, that has thought it fit to retain such provisions in the statute in order to eliminate the danger of its being transmitted to other people from the person affected by the disease, unquote. <clears throat> this danger is what now constitutes the truth of leprosy, not its mildly infectious nature, according to the Sloan Dolan Dictionary. <clears throat> But in the final paragraph, and this is the most interesting part of it, in the final paragraph, the court reverts to current scientific knowledge, which, it says, does not consider leprosy even mildly infectious, and states that the social exclusion of persons with leprosy is unwarranted, and that, quote, the Antiquated Lepers Act 1898 and sub subsequent similar state acts have been justly repealed. 
Now we need to understand that segregation does not necessarily only mean physical confinement is in an asylum. What was being justified in the case of Virendra Pandua, disqualification from holding public office is also an act of segregation. It comes out of understanding segregation as the only strategy. Isolation of people with leprosy, their removal from public life also constitutes segregation. So the court on the one hand is actually justifying the segregation of Devendra Pandwa. On the other hand, using scientific knowledge, it's saying, look, look, it's, it's not very infectious really, after having called it a contagious disease. It's not really very infectious and scientific wisdom now says that it's a, a segregation is not warranted. And therefore, the court concludes, therefore, keeping in view the present thinking and researches carried out on leprosy and with professional input, the legislature, that is the Orissa legislature, the legislature may seriously consider whether it is still necessary to retain such provisions in the statutes, whether it is necessary to continue to have sections 16.14 and 17.1b on the Orissa Municipal Act or to amend the act by removing these provisions. <clears throat> what then is the truth of leprosy? Is it contagious or merely mildly infectious? Are persons like Pandua a source of public danger and may justly be socially excluded, the fundamental rights of citizens set aside? Or is the law that declares them to be so wrong and unjust? How reasonable is the classification that dis disqualifies them, which the court had found reasonable enough in the earlier paragraph? The debate over the contagiousness of leprosy is not recent, and its history in India can be traced back to the late 19th century, around the time when G. A. Hansen isolated in 1874 Hansen, a Norwegian doctor, was the first actually to isolate the causative agent of leprosy. Before that it was known, it was not known what caused leprosy. So Hansen isolated this <coughs> uh, uh, bacterium called Mycobacterium lepri as the causative agent and in 1874 published his paper. The two major theories of leprosy transmission at the time were heredity and contagion. Those who subscribe to the former, that is believed that heredity, uh, uh, the leprosy was caused by heredity, being hereditary, they held that it posed no danger to the public. Those who subscribe to the latter, that is the contagion theory, argued that it was a public health risk and advocated segregation. It was in the midst of this debate that the Indian Lepers Act was passed by the colonial government in 1898, though it was not enforced by most local authorities. For the scientists, the question seemed to be the truth of leprosy. But for the government, it involved additionally the question of what is politically prudent. If leprosy is contagious, segregation is a must. But segregating lepers in asylums can be expensive as well as imprudent if it is construed as an excessive interference in the personal lives of the native subjects. <coughs> At no cost should a situation like that of the sepoy mutiny be precipitated again. We'll see more of such arguments later. At the same time, there were missionary organizations that were prepared to keep lepers in mission asylums and they urged segregation based on the contagionist thesis. Calls for action were certainly motivated by what the state held to be true of the disease. But this truth itself was the outcome of complex factors ranging from economic, political and evangelical to clinical and public health responses to the problem of leprosy. Now I go to <coughs> uh, the first of Wright's books that I am taking up briefly. In Leprosy and Segregation, published in 1885, Henry Press Wright summarizes the arguments of the leading lepro leprologists of the time on the heredity slash contagion debate. 
Wright's account shows that there was little clarity about the mode of propagation, based as it was solely on the interpretation of statistical data. And he cites Dr. Van Dyke Carter's view on this. And this cite is this quotation, these words are not Henry Press writes. They are Dr. Van Dyke Carter's, who was, an, who was one of the most uh, eminent uh, uh, experts on leprology, or, I mean leprosy, or one of the most eminent leprologists of the 19th century. So <coughs> it's Carter who writes this. Heredity as a mode of transmission of disease is subject to exceptions. That is, it cannot be accepted completely. No less than is contagion. Contagion too cannot be accepted completely. As soon as one difficulty is met by a fair assumption, on either view alone, another difficulty will arise. And it seems to me that we are not as yet enough acquainted with any whole series of cases to warrant valid uh, uh, inference. This is Van Dyke Carter on the, both the heredity thesis and the contagion thesis. Carter, who was professor of anatomy at Grant Medical College, Bombay, and one of the most reputed leprologists of British India, had himself initially supported the heredity thesis, but cited subsequently with the contagionists. Adding to this confusion was the debate over contagion versus infection. Even if leprosy is caused by a, 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 a pathogen, a disease-causing organism, the question is exactly what is the degree of transmissibility? Is it contagious, that is highly transmissible, and therefore requiring steps to control it? Or is it simply infectious? There were two views about this uh, in the <coughs> second half of the 19th century. Adding to this confusion was the debate over contagion versus infection. Even if one accepted the pathogenic origin of leprosy, there remained the question of how rapidly it was spread and the related issue, therefore, of segregating lepers. Dr. Joubert, who was an Indian Medical Service officer, reporting uh, from Bardwan district in West Bengal in 1877, wrote, quote, I have seen nothing in the cases of leprosy that have come under my observation to support the popular idea that leprosy is contagious, unquote. In 1866, a very important committee was constituted to investigate this, the Leprosy Committee of the Royal College of Physicians. And this is how the committee concluded its report. Quote, though there is some difference of opinion regarding its infectious or contagious nature, the facts recorded appear to be strongly in favor of its not being communicable from person to person. And it goes on. <coughs> The cruelties which have been perpetrated on those laboring under or suspected of having this terrible disease afford a striking example of the evils resulting from error. The erroneous belief usually entertained that leprosy is contagious. Now, I am not bringing these texts to establish that leprosy is contagious or leprosy is not contagious. My point is to understand two things. One, that it was not clear at that point of time whether <coughs> leprosy was contagious or merely infectious or even hereditary. <coughs> there was a great deal of confusion about it at that time. And therefore, the very way in which the Lepers Act 1898 was brought in and passed making it mandatory to segregate lepers in leprosy asylums becomes questionable. And hence, in the present instance, the Supreme Court's assumption, unquestioned assumption, that leprosy being a contagious disease is questionable. This, my second point is to look at the way in which leprosy comes to be constructed as a problem in various kinds of discourses, public health discourse, missionary discourse, literary discourse, legislative dis discourse, etc. The various ways in which leprosy comes to be constituted as a problem which requires an official intervention, which requires an official response. And <clears throat> what we need to look at is what kind of a problem is it posed as? How is it problematized, posed as a problem? And what kind of 
social responses and legal responses and medical responses come to be warranted on the basis of this construction. But a polemical tract urging segregation in the colonies so that the disease does not enter here. His problem is not leprosy. His problem is how to keep the metropolis safe. Its concluding chapter titled, Are Europeans Liable to Leprosy? Is England in Danger? That's the title of the last chapter. Clearly expresses this. By summarizing the debate over contagion versus heredity and contagion versus infection, Wright tries to establish three points. One, there is no consensus as to how dangerous leprosy actually is. Two, it is incurable. At that point of time, it was incurable. <coughs> it is incurable and causes immense moral and bodily suffering ending in a miserable death. And three, therefore, it is better to impose segregation, err on the side of safety, than to vote disaster. That is essentially right's logic. We can clearly see how this argument is founded on an anxiety. The anxiety of the contamination of a Europe that has you know, cleansed itself, to use the biblical metaphor, that has cleansed itself of the leprosy it had acquired in the medieval period. Leprosy and segregation is not about the nature of the disease. It is not about leprosy but about justifications for imposing segregation on England's colonial populations. Quote, we in England surely have more reason to dread a reintroduction of the malady than to boast of its complete departure from us. Ere we are aware of it, the fearful scourge may again be actively in our midst and England, who thought herself so safe, be with a closely packed population again in the field of its cruel ravages. So, it's not the objective fact of leprosy that he is concerned with. It is, no, <clears throat> for right, establishing leprosy as a contagious disease is crucial to what he feels as an anxious need, the need to protect pathogenically, the need to protect Europe from a possible attack of leprosy that had happened, you know, a repeat of what had happened during the medieval ages. Right urges of segregation not, for the, not only for the safety of England, however, but also expresses this equally as Christian duty for the suffering leper. And I quote from the book, Shall no heed be paid to the loud, piteous wail of the leper heard from every corner of the earth? Shall nothing be done to help the bitterly affected, not in the hours, but in the years of their bodily and mental torture? No pen, however powerful, no tongue, however eloquent, can picture the misery of the despised and helpless leper. In other words, he presents all possible arguments for segregating colonial lepers in asylums. And he says that the lepers themselves would be grateful to be segregated because they will then be saved from doing themselves harm. For segregating colonial lepers in asylums in order to keep the metropolis pathogenically safe and free of disease. A law enforcing segregation, however, was not passed by many colonial governments, including India. And Wright reiterated his views in another book published four years later, in 1889. The argument of this book, Leprosy and Imperial Danger, that's the title of the book, is essentially the same as that of the earlier book, only more focused on the issue of contagion from the colonies. The book concludes with a proposal for a leprosy association in London with branches in India and other colonies to collect statistical data and pressurize colonial governments to make segregation mandatory. Uppermost in his mind is the security of England at a time of increased colonization in the tropics. The threat of leprosy, this is last part, last two, three decades of the 19th century, period of rapid colonization. The threat of leprosy was multiplied, as he writes, quote, in these days of general travel and easy intercommunication of nations, unquote. Right, who was a chaplain in the British Army at the time of writing the two books, nevertheless frequently justifies his campaign against leprosy as a humanitarian concern for the leper, as we just saw from the extract that I read out as a humanitarian concern for the leper, 
expressed as paternalistic benevolence and priestly duty. And I quote from Wright, the poor despised and rejected one from the midst of his bitter reflection invites us to hasten and help him. Let us gladly heed the sad and solemn appeal and our holy joy shall be that inasmuch as we do it unto one of the least of these our brethren, we do it unto Christ. By the end of the 19th century, a large number of asylums had been set up by Christian missions in India to receive and care for pauper lepers, the most active of them being the Mission to Lepers, founded by Wellesley C. Bailey in 1874. In 1901, John Jackson published In Leper Land, a detailed report on these missionary asylums including mostly the Mission to Leper Asylums. Jackson was honorary treasurer and founder member of the Missionary Pence Association of London, a charitable organization that funded the asylums. His book is a detailed account of his tour of 7,000 miles across <coughs> India, which he undertook in 1900, to observe and report on the work of the leprosy missions. In Leper Land is primarily about the evangelical work of the missions and not medical matters. But Jackson also takes up and expresses strong support for the contagionist thesis, perhaps because it legitimized the need for asylums that would otherwise be unwarranted. If leprosy is not contagious, no need for asylums. He devotes a chapter uh, to the homes for what he calls untainted children run by mission to lepers. Leprosy was, even in medical, even by doctors, was called a taint. Now, having leprosy, if somebody had leprosy, the word quite often would be used as he is tainted. And you know, that, that very clearly points to the moral connotations. It's not just medical, we can say it's a kind of medical moral conceptualization of leprosy as both uh, uh, you know, uh, a contagion and a contamination. So, <clears throat> the homes for these untainted, uh, untainted children run by mission to lepers, where he claims to find proof of what he calls the non-heredity of leprosy. He cites as expert confirmation the findings of the 1890 Leprosy Commission, the Berlin Congress of Leprologists of 1897, and the views of noted contagionists, while omitting those that argued otherwise. It is not surprising that Henry Wright and John Jackson, both men of religion, are convinced that leprosy is contagious and neither hereditary nor merely infectious. And the source of it may have been the Bible. Leviticus chapter 13, especially verses 44 to 46, represent leprosy as uh, both a highly contagious disease and a moral taint that could be cleansed only by the priest and that warranted segregation, warranted social exclusion of the leper. And in so doing, the priest was actually following Christ's example as in Matthew chapter 8 verses 1 to 4, where Christ comes from the mountain and cleanses a leper. This man uh, 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 stands before Christ and says, I have leprosy and you only can cleanse me. And then Christ touches him and says, you are cleansed, you are clean. So the care of the leper became also missionary duty. A subordinate theme in Jackson's book, which is a remarkable mix of very, very, uh, you know, exciting book. Uh, uh, have rarely seen a report that's so lively. It's a remarkable mix of official report, travel writing, witness literature and promotional tract. A subordinate theme in the book is the, uh, is the opportunity for religious conversion that mission work afforded. At Dehra, Jackson reports with approval, there were 146 inmates out of which 48 were Christian. At Almora, 96 inmates with 90 of them Christians by their own spontaneous desire. And at Purulia, 577 baptized lepers out of a total population of some 600. Now, I must make it very clear that these conversions or baptisms were not forced. And my sources are not simply Jackson's book, but other, other books. There's one written by Wellesley Bailey, plus reports plus government reports, they were not forced, they were not compelled. Though uh, the question of what compulsion actually means, what it actually entails is difficult. I have leprosy, I am tainted, I am ostracized from my society, I have no wherewithal to live, 
no family to support me. I'm roaming around begging for food. And some people take me and give me excellent care and give me clean surroundings, clean bed to sleep in, belly full of food every day, and then console me through the word of their God, I will believe them. They don't need to coerce me into conver uh, conversion. I will believe that this is the true religion. And that is what actually the medical missionary work did. So these were not compelled, these were not forced conversions at all. And uh, uh, Jackson makes it very clear that they were not forced. And that's why everyone was not converted. Whoever wished, whoever wanted. So the missions would admit Hindus as well as Muslims as well as people of any religion <coughs> and take care of them. In the Mungeli Asylum, Jackson reports witnessing the baptism of 28 lepers on a single afternoon. The Bhagalpur Asylum, he notes, is a notoriously hard, hard one, with only three baptisms in 1900. But it proved that the seed had not been sown in vain. On the worth of medical missionary work, Jackson remarks, quote, there have been many instances in which the ministry of healing has prepared the way for that spiritual message which it is the primary object of missions to convey. The most valued converts are high caste Hindus and an aged Muslim Malvi, which Jackson writes, whose story is a striking example of the power of the truth to overcome the bitterest prejudice. Thus, while rights stake in the contagionist thesis is linked to imperial danger, Jackson's is evangelical to extend, quote unquote, the vital force of Christianity in steadily, if slowly, uh, supplanting the lifeless creeds that have so long held the races of India in bondage. My point is not about the conversion. My point is about the different imperatives under which leprosy was presented as contagious. In the case of Henry Press Wright, the imperative was protection of the metropolis, the imperialist imperative. In the case of people like John Jackson, the imperative was evangelical. So my point is not the question of the rightness of what he is proposing or what Henry Press Wright is proposing, but the way in which leprosy or a certain truth of leprosy comes to be constructed in discourses under imperatives that are not at once or not clearly visible to us. Let me now turn to the views of medical professionals on leprosy in India, the presumed contagiousness of leprosy and the need for segregation. For the sake of brevity, I will cite only two views, one supporting segregation and the other opposing it. In his report on leprosy in the Bombay Presidency, published in 1872, Dr. Van Dyke Carter, the Grant Medical College professor we mentioned earlier, Dr. Van Dyke Carter stated, quote, the segregation of lepers seems most desirable for in India, as long as diseased people are allowed to freely intermix with others, this cause will be propagated by marriage and by intermarriage with the affected. And the morally bad effects on the people of permitting them to harbor in their midst miserable and often disgusting cripples are, when the number of such subjects is considerable, quite undeniable. That's why segregation must be imposed. In another report published in 1876 in a report titled <coughs> a Report on Leprosy in uh, Europe and uh, uh, Bombay, published in 1876, Carter wrote, from some considerations which have presented themselves to me, I am disposed to infer that should the colonization of India be ever attempted on a large scale, there would be a decided risk of the new population becoming tainted with leprosy. Nay, this risk might be converted into a positive infliction where not means taken to prevent a possible communication of the disease and therefore strict regulations would have to be enforced. Segregation and you know, <coughs> appropriately, Henry Press Wright quotes this passage. In the following year, however, that is 1877, doctors Timothy Richard Lewis and David D. Cunningham published Leprosy in India, a report, in which they claimed that leprosy was transmitted hereditarily and segregation was therefore both impractical and unwarranted. And I quote from the report. 
the history of the asylum, this is the Almora asylum where they carried out their study. The history of the asylum gives no support to the doctrine that leprosy is a contagious disease, but strong evidence to the contrary. Unquote. On segregation, they wrote, quote, it is evident that any attempt at stamping it out by compulsory segregation of leprous persons would prove whole, uh, uh, wholly impracticable. For it would not only be necessary to segregate those suffering from developed disease whom you can see and therefore you can segregate, but also those hereditarily disposed to it who have not yet shown the symptoms. How and by whom could the predisposition be determined? If leprosy has not yet appeared and somebody is simply predisposed to leprosy by heredity, how do you know who is predisposed, who is not? Those are the days genetic science had not emerged. Cunningham was at that time special assistant to the Sanitary Commission of India and Lewis was his co-worker. Even after segregation was subsequently made mandatory, provincial authorities were reluctant to implement. Jackson's In Leper Land makes a special note of this reluctance and the efforts of the mission to lepers to get the authorities to enforce the law. Why were colonial governments reluctant to impose segregation? Two reasons most commonly advanced were economic viability and native sentiment. Quote, it has been objected by the government of India, wrote Dr. William Munro, that the expense of segregating more than 100,000 lepers in asylums would be too great and therefore the government is not interested in implementing the Lepers Act of 1898. As James Staples has pointed out, public health administrators hesitated to introduce measures that might be challenged by upper caste class Indians with whom they most often interacted. Their apprehension, it appears, was often well founded. In the plague epidemic of Bombay presidency at the turn of the 20th century, for instance, 1896 to 1900, for instance, measures to segregate infected persons led to widespread riots and in 1897, the assassination of W.C. Rand, the sanitary commissioner, the plague commissioner of Pune. If you go to Pune University in front of the gate, you have a statue of W.C. Rand. <clears throat> Pune's sanitary commissioner, Dr. R. Harvey, declared in a letter to the colonial government in 1898, the year after Rand's assassination, quote, what is medically desirable may be practically impossible and politically dangerous, unquote. An advice that would apply generally to all circumstances calling for segregation. Besides, as Radhika Ramasuban has argued, Colonial medical intervention in India was primarily concerned with the health of the Europeans and given their spatial distance, the European speci spatial in space, spatial distance from native populations, leprosy posed little danger to them. In 1890, Viceroy Lansdowne wrote to the Secretary of State for India, quote, legislation for the compulsory detention of lepers will only be justifiable when it has been established beyond reasonable doubt that the disease is contagious. In order to investigate the matter further, a leprosy commission was appointed by the colonial government in 1890-91 to examine the need for segregation. And this is what it stated in its report, published 1892. Quote, neither compulsory nor voluntary segregation would at present effectually stamp out the disease or even markedly diminish the leper population under existing conditions of life in India. It can only be hoped that by means of improved sanitation and good dietetic conditions, a diminution, diminution, uh, diminution of leprosy will result. Unquote. It specifically opposed an imperial act for segregation of lepers, who in its opinion were, and I quote from the report, far less dangerous to a community than insane or syphilitic people. Unquote. Eventually, in 1898, the colonial government yielded to mounting pressure and passed the Lepers Act, making it mandatory for the government to segregate pauper lepers in asylums. The passing of the act was the outcome of canvassing by doctors like Carter, Henry Van Dyke Carter, <coughs> proponents of the imperial danger thesis like Henry Press Wright, and evangelical organizations like the Mission to Lepers. It had two important effects, the passing of the Lepers Act. First, 
it accorded official recognition to the contagionist thesis, about which there was still no consensus among medical authorities. What had been a hypothesis, and that's how Hansen puts it, as Hansen himself called it, G. A. Hansen, the person who actually discovered Mycobacterium leprae, in the report actually said that contagion is a hypothesis. The, <clears throat> what had been a hypothesis, as Hansen, Hansen himself called it, was now formally acknowledged as fact. The construction of leprosy as contagious disease was thus the outcome of a circular relation between discourse and practice. Contagion theory necessitated the segregation of lepers, and the segregation of lepers in turn confirmed the theory as true. The second effect of the Lepers Act was to accord official recognition to the asylum as the institution of choice for isolation and treatment of lepers, which meant that they could receive grants in aid from the government, a fact that bore no little consideration for cash-strapped missions. Let me now turn to the story by Conan Doyle, which comes last in my chronology. Published in 1926, The Blanched Soldier is about the fear of leprosy being imported to England from South Africa during the Boer War. Godfrey Emworth, a British sol soldier who served in the war, you know, this is the war between the British and the South African, uh, the, the Boers. Uh, Godfrey Emworth, a British soldier who served in the war, returns home to discover that he has contracted a disease which he suspects to be leprosy. Wounded in a battle at Pretoria, Godfrey had unwittingly taken shel shelter in a leper hospital. He didn't know that it was a leper hospital and spent a night in a leper's bed. His family, fearing segregation by the local authorities, hides him in a cottage on their country estate. Godfrey's account of what he saw when he woke up in the leper hospital evokes the horrors of leprosy represented in the medic medical and missionary literature of the period, as well as the terrifying image of, dis uh, image of disfigurement that the Supreme Court notes in the Pandua judgment. And I quote from the story. In front of me was standing a small dwarf-like man with a huge bulbous head who was jabbering excitedly in Dutch, waving two horrible hands which looked to me like brown sponges. Behind him stood a group of people who seemed to be intensely amused by the situation. But a chill came over me as I looked at them. Not one of them was a normal human being. Every one was twisted or swollen or disfigured in some strange way. The laughter of these monstrosities was a dreadful thing to hear. However, the story ends on a happy note, as Godfrey's ailment is discovered to be not leprosy, but a harmless and non-infective skin disease called pseudoleprosy or ichthyosis. Commissioned by Godfrey's friend James to investigate his mysterious disappearance, it is Sherlock Holmes who discovers the truth. Read along, alongside Wright's Leprosy and Segregation and Leprosy and Imperial Danger, the Blanche so soldier offers an account of the fear of imperial contamination, which is allayed by the happy ending that reaffirms Europe's, Europe's safety. But the reaffirmation is only tentative, as contagion is evaded not by concerted effort on the part of the authorities, but by fortuitous circumstance. Godfrey's leprosy is luckily a misdiagnosis. Doyle's story, in other words, keeps alive the panic of colonial contagion, even as it tries to allay it. In an essay on the theme of contagion and empire in Doyle's stories, Susan Harris writes, quote, disease still fixed in the landscape, is now also frighteningly mobile and the human contact that was an inevitable result makes imperial rule more dangerous. Harris's meaning is that it is still understood that disease is fixed only in the tropics because of which in the late 19th century you have the emergence of a discipline called tropical medicine. I mean tropical medicine. There's no <coughs> equivalent discipline called temperate medicine. So, Tropical medicine, which is a very ideologically formed medical discipline, you know, with the assumption that the, tro the, the tropics are diseased, the tropics are places of disease. And there's been considerable, uh, very, very interesting historical work done on the emergence of tropical medicine as a, uh, this thing. So Harris's meaning is that they still continued this idea that disease is fixed in locations. 
But due to the increased pace of colonization at the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, which is the period of Conan Doyle's short stories, there was also the fear of the mobility of diseases, the fear of diseases traveling across, you know, and diseases becoming globalized, a fear which continues even till now, the fear of globalization of diseases. So talking about the ill effects of globalization, one of the things you need to talk about is transborder epidemics. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> whatever be the actual burden of imported disease, moral panics about colonial contagion were, were intense, as Wright's texts, the medical reports he cites, and the blast soldier testify. And I'm coming now to the end. <clears throat> Thank you very much for, the, for your patience. I've been trying your patience for a long time. <laughs> Just a, a, a couple of minutes. <clears throat> My last page. <laughs> The understanding of leprosy was divided, therefore, with no unanimity among experts as to its presumed contagiousness and the danger it posed. Medical legal decision making was, <coughs> as Sanjeev Kakar has argued, influenced by non scientific attitudes, and the segregation of persons with leprosy under the Lepers Act of 1898 was the outcome, equally, of recommendations by public health administrators and the pressure exerted by lay groups such as philanthropists, uh, <coughs> priests, and missionary organizations. <coughs> what characterized the understanding of leprosy at the turn of the 20th century, and this is uh, uh, you know, the, the point I'm really trying to make in this paper, what characterized the understanding of leprosy at the turn of the 20th century was the dominance of contagionism as a style of thinking, which restricted options to segregation, and thereby confirmed the truth of leprosy as a contagious disease. It was the horrifying image of the leper. In Jackson's words, quote, the most lowly and loathsome of suffering humanity. It was the horrifying image of the leper more than any actual danger that he posed, which prompted a legislative action based on <coughs> fear rather than fact. Texts like rights, leprosy and segregation and leprosy and imperial danger, Jackson's In Leper Land, and Doyle's The Blanched Soldier were instrumental in giving cultural force to the contagionist thesis. So these are not medical texts, which eventually came to be established as the medical legal truth of leprosy. Its impact was such that it has continued to cast a long shadow, even after leprosy now is easily cured with multi-drug therapy and medical knowledge of its transmissibility is much more certain. The contradictions in the Supreme Court's judgment on Dhirendra Pandwa bear the effect of this long shadow. The court's understanding is problematically divided between the scientific truth of leprosy and a different truth legated by contagionism's discursive history. Let me conclude by briefly referring to a bill passed recently by the Lok Sabha on the 7th of January this year. Marriage laws in India, such as the Divorce Act of 1869, Dissolution of Muslim Marriages Act of 1939, Special Marriage Act of 1954, and Hindu Marriage Act of 1955, these acts provide for the dissolution of a marriage on ground of leprosy, which is implicitly understood as a terrible and life-threatening disease. The Personal Laws Amendment Bill 2018, which the Lok Sabha passed on 7th of last month, not yet an act, needs the approval of the Rajya Sabha. The Personal Laws Amendment Bill 2018 seeks to remove all such provisions, as leprosy is at present, and I'm quoting from the act, and it will completely curable and can be treated with multi-drug therapy. Unquote. It considers these anachronistic provisions to be discriminatory, factually incorrect, and therefore unjust. Most importantly, it replaces the term leprosy patient, which reduces the identity of a person to the subsuming condition of disease, like the term leper, with a more value-neutral term, person affected with leprosy. It constructs the person with leprosy not as a danger to society, but as themselves being in danger of discrimination and exclusion by unjust social norms. Thus, 
the personal laws amendment bill is in one sense strikingly in contrast to the Pandua judgment in the way it constructs the truth of leprosy. In another sense, however, it marks the fulfillment of a possibility he suggests but does not realize in stating that the legislature needs to revisit in the last part of the government, the legislature needs to revisit the disqualifying provisions of the Orissa Municipal Act. Medical legal rationality, which I have critiqued using the Pandua judgment, is not static or monolithic, but responds to changes in the wider social understanding of disease and persons with disease, which is both ground for hope and a challenge. Hope of a more just social order, and the challenge that lies in realizing it. My talk intends to show one way in which we can meet this challenge through a sustained interdisciplinary critique of medical legal reason. Interdisciplinary inquiries, as I have tried to show above, can open up new questions and offer new insights into the otherwise invisible workings of discourse, power, and regimes of truth. Thank you. Thank you.